I'm going to talk a little bit tonight about bird banding. Can everybody hear me okay? I can, yep. Okay, so a little bit about bird banding. We're all familiar with these banded birds. Um, I'm going to talk about mostly birds that we band that are uh, seabirds and shorebirds. That's kind of been my focus during my professional life. But a little bit, I'm going to throw a little bit in there about some other of the smaller birds for all you birders that, that look at warblers and things like that. All these birds that are pretty much foreign to me that I've had blinders on for the past 20 years. So just looking at salty birds, that's, that's what I like to call them. So I, I guess we'll start with, you know, why we ban birds. <clears throat> so, you know, most birds, they all look alike. Males and females sometimes are different, but in general, birds of the same species look similar. So we use this basically to identify individuals. And then by doing that, we can follow their movements is basically what we're trying to do. And we learn things about where they like to breed, whether they come back to the same areas to breed, how they move, where they migrate, how long they live. And survival is a big thing. You know, we get to know if these birds are doing okay, if we see them year after year, after we ban them as chicks maybe in a breeding colony and they return to breed themselves, we have an idea of the health of the population. We can also measure an individual chick's growth during a breeding season um, while it's approaching fledging and to see if it's gaining weight like it should and things like that. And I think that's the basic the basic idea behind banding birds is to try to learn as much as we can. And I think this last bullet you can see here that it allows us to tell a good story. So all those things that I just mentioned are the story of that bird. And then gaining all of this data and this knowledge and condensing it down to being able to tell a good story, kind of like what I'm gonna to attempt to do tonight. I guess you guys are the judge where I tell a good story, but I'm gonna to try to tell you the story of these birds. And a really important result of banding is these stories that we can bring to the public where they may not have this scientific data or this insight into how these birds live and it gets people really interested in birds. It gets them motivated to protect birds, to watch birds, to vote in a way that's good for birds and the environment in general. So I think that might be the biggest benefit to banding birds um, is it helps us manage them by getting the public involved in conservation. So I wanna show this map. This is a map a lot of people have seen. These are just all the different flyways, which basically shows, and this is how we have to depict it in an image, that birds are moving everywhere, almost the entire globe. And these little colored tracks in different flyways, but really everywhere, every time of the year, day and night, there's some bird migrating somewhere. So it's not just a spring and a fall thing. It's all the time. There's always birds moving. And I think the best way to think about this in a, in a, in a different way would be that if you imagine every single bird on the planet towing a really thin thread behind it, in very short order, everything from ground level up to above 39,000 feet would pretty much be covered in thread all over the planet. The surface of all, all water bodies, near shore ocean and offshore ocean, rivers, streams, lakes, ponds would all be covered in thread. And then below those water bodies down to 200 feet, 300 feet and more would be covered in thread. So almost the entire planet would be covered in thread if these little birds were towing around the thread. And I think it it's a good way to show how, how connected birds are to every piece of the planet and how connected we are to birds and they move everywhere. And I'm gonna to try to show you that in, in these upcoming slides. Different, these are different examples of projects that I've worked on or colleagues have worked on and what we've learned about birds and the things that they're doing. So of course, shamelessly, I'm gonna talk about my own project first. This is the most important banded birds on the planet are the Florida banded black skimmers. But I started banding black skimmers in 2017 on Marco Island. We didn't really have an idea of where do these Florida black skimmers go. The conventional wisdom was that they just stayed in Florida and other black skimmers migrated from places like as north as Massachusetts down to Florida. And we really didn't know what our birds did. We didn't know how, how well the chicks were doing post-fledging. We didn't know if they were surviving. We didn't know any of that. So we started banning the birds and we're starting to get some data in to show us a little bit more about how our skimmers are doing and where they're going. So this is a, a just a quick map just showing where some of these birds have been recited. 
So our Florida birds move, that red dot down there is really where I ban birds. <clears throat> That's south of Fort Myers. And then those other dots around the Tampa area are where a colleague of mine is banding black skimmers. So we do get a lot of sightings, obviously close to where we're banding them. But then you can see how they're moving around. They're not just staying in Florida. And we have some preliminary reports of birds um, in Cuba. So our, some of our birds might be going to Cuba in the winter. We don't know for sure, but we're working on that to try to figure it out. We do get a lot of birds that go into Lake Okeechobee. So I have birds that I've banded or birds that I'm reciting here currently in Collier County in Naples. And I'll see them on Clam Pass Park, which is right on the Gulf here. And then maybe five or six days later, they'll be on the boat docks of Pahokee on Lake Okeechobee. So for some reason, they like to, to move back and forth. So we're starting to get an idea of how they're moving, which is helping us as far as management is concerned, because we can identify these really important breeding and roosting sites. And then it helps us protect them. <clears throat> Another really, um, a really important thing for my banding project and one that, you know, I just, I started to realize once I started doing it is it's an all volunteer project. So my grant, the way it's written, it doesn't have scientific research in it necessarily. So we do this all, everybody that does this is a volunteer. So I have a master banding permit, which I should say, the only way I'm allowed to do this is with the proper federal permit. So I do have a master banding permit of my own. And then I get a lot of volunteers, college students, um, just a member, interested members of the public, some of my beach stewards, and uh, they all come out and I kind of rotate them through. Before COVID, we would take a group of about 10 people out there to kind of chase these birds around the beach at night with headlamps and butterfly nets. And we catch a few at a time and then we do the processing in the band. And you can see in the lower left there, that's a bird after it's been banded. And that's the kind of band I use to be able to recite them easily. And then the more years I've been doing this, the more and more um, the public has gotten to know this project. They get to participate in this project and they're really into it. And they're really into protecting the birds because of it. So we really see this groundswell here just from this project of people interested in the seabirds here and wanting to do whatever they can to protect them. So it's a really, um, it's a really cool project in that way where it's just spreading. And I do have people writing good articles about the project. I have all sorts of people calling me because they see the bands on the beach. So it's kind of like a scavenger hunt for these people. They're going out and walking, they're bringing their binoculars and they're reciting the birds. And I just say a, a quick story, Clam Pass Park in Naples is a place where the birds aren't breeding but they're spending the winter there. We get birds from Massachusetts, Long Island, almost every breeding colony on the East Coast of the United States comes down to Clam Pass Park in the winter. And the number of birds is really large. It's the largest wintering flock of black skimmers in the Eastern United States. And they proposed to build a parking garage there last year and they were gonna increase foot traffic, which would really disturb these birds. And because these skimmers are so well known, I guess here for lack of a better term, when that started becoming a public, public knowledge, people really were protesting it. And the county killed that project. So now they're just gonna leave it the way it was, which is good. And they also then gave us permission to put up a posting in the winter. So when it gets really busy, those birds have a place to shuffle into where they can rest without being disturbed. Nobody's running through them, nobody's bothering them. So it went from a parking garage to add, you know, 500 people to that beach to a protected area in the winter for black skimmers, which is not something that's common in Florida. And another thing that I'm just starting to learn this year is survival of these black skimmers. So here's a bird, this bird here on the left facing the camera is C48. This is a picture from the uh, summer of 2017, the first year of the banding project. This bird is probably just, just post fledging. So 26, 27 days old when this picture was taken sometime in August of 2017. And here's that bird this year on the same, in the same colony at Marco Island, C48, and it's raising its own chicks. So that's really exciting for me to see because it, we're starting to see that these birds, at least some of these birds are surviving and they're coming back and they're breeding. And lots of my volunteers were, were with me when we banded these birds. So this gets people really excited about it. And it's really important that they're coming back and breeding. Some of them are doing really well. So it looks like, you know, we're, we have a decent survival. It's still too early to tell, but we were getting birds to come back to Marco Island this summer to breed. They don't breed till they're three years old. So this was the first season that that was possible. And I did see some of my banded birds breeding at Carlos Point, which is north in Lee County. And then some Marco banded birds were also breeding in Pinellas County. So we're seeing a good exchange 
of genetics in between these colonies. So that helps us understand this population a little bit better because of this project. And we've only been doing it a few short years and we're already starting to see some, some really cool data coming in. Now I'm gonna to switch to pelicans. So this is another cool story I think of a banded bird. So this bird was banded in 2010, in the summer of 2010. We all know what happened there, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. I was a part of that project, not the pelican project, but I was working with piping clovers. But this bird was brought in with, I think probably 30 other pelicans to a rehab place in Louisiana and it was banded. They were all banded, they were cleaned up treated and banded and released. And there's been like, there's a discussion on whether this um, rehabbing these oil birds and treating these oil birds, if it's worth it and it works. Well, this bird <clears throat> was banded in 2010 and released and it wasn't seen again, probably just figured it was dead. And then there it is perched on a tree in Sanibel Island. A, a colleague friend of mine at um, SCCF, Audrey Albrecht took this photo and it was in 2018. So eight years later, it was seen for the first time. Who knows where this bird was? and why nobody recited it, but it's a good example of how important it is to um, deal with these, these oil spills when they happen, rehab these birds, because at least some of them survive. This is a sample size of one, but there is other data that other birds do survive, and every bird right now is, is worth its weight in gold. I mean, we need to protect every one. So I like to say we, like, we're moving beach by beach and bird by bird, so any bird that we can, we can save is worth it. And they also use this as an example in a conference where they were discussing these types of things and whether or not it was worth permitting these, these places to rehab oil spilled birds. And I think they use this as a reason why we should be doing that. So I think that's a cool, um, we didn't get much management data out of that bird, but it's a cool data point that once we do, once one of these oil spills happen or something like that, it's worth the effort put in by a lot, mostly volunteers to help these birds ban them and release them. So here's my one, uh, my one boreal nesting bird, a, neotrop a neotropical migrant. Um, here's kind of the classic map you see. This is kind of how songbirds migrate, all those boreal nesters. There's a lot of different flyways, as you can see. And these are kind of the traditional maps. This is what everybody thought these birds did um, based on banding data and things like that. They kind of have their basic flyways. They try to get there as directly as possible. But then, then they did black pole warbler research, started looking at some banding data from black pole warblers and they put transmitters on them. And you can see in this map how strange this, this migration is. So, so this bird, even the black pole warblers that migrate all the way on the western edge of Alaska, they all fly east, pretty much to the east coast of the United States or maritime Canada, then they fly south. That's the migration route they take when they're returning to their um, wintering ground. So that's really, it's really an amazing thing. And it's really good insight into how these birds are traveling. And also, which is just amazing all by itself, right? That the birds can fly that far. They weigh as much as a couple of sheets of paper. And I think also it lets you focus in on this migration route and you can um, start to think about things like, you hear a lot about these bird friendly communities, which Audubon has an initiative like that, plants for birds, planting just a section of your backyard for birds. And if you can imagine that blue line through Canada and then down through the United States. If there was a patchwork of people that planted their yards for birds or entire communities or parks that were planted for birds, this black pole warbler will have places to stop along this route because it needs to feed the entire time. I mean, it needs to build up that fat reserve so when it finally leaves the East Coast, it can make it where it's going. So when people ask me like if one person can make, make a difference or if it really matters if you plant those plants in your backyard, it does. And it may really matter for this black pole warbler. The th th these birds could be out of steam completely. They can't go any further. And they find your backyard planted with native plants where they can land, they can rest, they have shelter and they have food. And that could be any bird like this. I'm just using this black pole warbler because it's such a dramatic example of these really tiny birds making these really epic long, long migrations. And then here's a little, another map. This is, black, a black, this is a black pole warbler. This is data where they put um, transmitters on these birds. So you can see here where they, they depart in the fall. That bird departed on October 13th and had a quick stopover for two days and then down to South America. So that whole trip only took that bird five days with a two day break. So you can really see there, if that bird gets to its departure point and there aren't 
good spaces for it to rest and feed, it's never going to make it. So really, it's not a straight line like this map shows. So those, what these birds do is they catch this northwest wind when they depart, and they kind of fly out over the Atlantic. And then they catch an easterly wind when they're quite a bit offshore, and it kind of hooks them back around. And then they stop over and then move. And then they move further south into, into South America. And then you can see when they come back, those birds like flying right up the right up peninsula of Florida and then heading up more, more over land on their migration route north. But they need, when they get there, they can't really be as depleted as they are on their fall migration because they're going to be laying eggs and raising chicks. So they kind of, they stay over where there's food sources. So you can see most of Florida is very important for these birds and then up, up the entire East Coast. So these patchworks of, of bird-friendly communities really for these birds is a really big deal. So when you think about things like that, one yard is worth a lot. When you think it's not, even if it's a corner of your yard, just a few plants, a couple of caterpillars and some seed could make a huge, huge difference for, for these birds moving through. And here's like the shorebird ambassador. This kind of put shorebirds on the map, shorebird conservation on the map was this bird here. This is a red knot. And red knots are kind of known for their epic migration. It's a bird that most people that look at shorebirds know about, they're into, they're out looking for. This bird in particular here, this is a orange flagged bird. And because it has an orange flag, we know based on banding protocols that it was banded in Argentina. It's where the birds spend the winter, very far south in Argentina. And then they fly, they're tundra nesters, so they're flying about, about 9,000 miles north to nest. A lot of them in the, in the spring bypass the state of Florida. They don't, they go around it. And a lot of them in the fall stop in Florida. This is an important stopover site for red knots. So our beaches and the health of our beaches and water is really important here. And by banding them, we kind of learn, you know, we do all this banding for years and years and we kind of learn this, like this is the map you can make. We know where they stop over. We know where they nest. We know where they winter. So for researchers, it's, it's really important because we can manage the resources in those critical areas they stop over. We all know the Delaware Bay is a huge stopover point um, for red knots, New Jersey and Delaware. And then also the Eastern shore of Virginia is an important place. Um, the peat banks in South Carolina, some birds that aren't breeding are spending their summers, summers there. They don't make the trip all the way north, kind of a partial migration. And then they just spend the summer feeding. And then we get a lot of birds that are resident Florida birds in the winter. They spend the winter here, they stay all year. We know that from banding. So we know which sites here are very important for red knots. So we kind of get an idea through banding what these birds are doing, <clears throat> how long they live and all that. But I think the really cool thing is how far they fly and how long they can live. So here's a bird B95. Some of you may be familiar with this bird. And this is Patricia Gonzalez, a friend and colleague of mine. She's the one that's banding these birds in Argentina. Huge, huge um, shorebird, seabird, environmental um, conservation advocate, a really good researcher. And this bird was named Moonbird and a book was written about this bird. So the author learned about these birds and, and saw this migration and learned how far they fly up to 18,000 miles a year. And then this bird B95, who at the time had flown the distance to the moon. So they called it Moonbird. And I think this bird was last seen in 2016. It was a fairly old bird. And I think by then it probably had flown the distance to the moon and back. So by banding this bird and being able to tell this cool story about an 18,000 mile migration, a book was written about it. And then so many people became um, interested and aware of the plight of the red knot and then all shorebirds and seabirds in general based on this book. So every people, the red knot got really, really po popular, I guess I would say, and people were really um, paying attention to shorebird conservation after this. I mean, this, this really put this kind of stuff on the map and more and more people are aware of it. You know, they pay attention when they're voting, they pay attention when they're on the beach and, and they're learning as much as they can about these birds because really the shorebirds and seabirds make some, you know, epic migrations that are just unbelievable. And by banning them, we can tell that story to the public and then we can help save these birds. I would say that that book and this banding really did help red knots and it got all sorts of things um, passed on, you know, in New Jersey and Delaware, there's moratoriums on harvesting horseshoe crabs because the, these birds rely so heavily on horseshoe crab eggs. So there's lots of conservation steps that have happened from this banding 
and from this public awareness and this push from the general public that we need to do better to take care of these birds. So here's what we were talking about earlier. This is, uh, you know, seems like everybody's favorite bird, the Atlantic puffin. So when I was up in Maine working with puffins, you know, people would ask us when I was early on there, where do the puffins go in the winter? Seems like a simple question, but we didn't know. We didn't really have any idea. We know they come back to land just to breed like these birds here. And then once they're done breeding, they leave and they just go out to sea. That's pretty much what we knew. We didn't know much of anything else, but we had banded a lot of birds. So we had some idea who was coming back, but we still didn't know where they went. So what we did was we put, a, we put geolocators on these birds. And these are tags that measure ambient light to get a latitude and longitude of where the bird is located when the data is downloaded. And we kind of, this, this little map here, this is kind of what we found out. So the circle in the middle is the nesting colonies in Maine. There's several islands managed by Project Puffin and the Fish and Wildlife Service where we attach these geolocators. And the birds went north to the Gulf of St. Lawrence after they left. So they didn't go south in the winter. They kind of went north in the beginning, early fall. And it's a food related um, movement. Um, we're sure of that. I mean, educated guess, but pretty sure of that. And they're up there feeding for a while. Then they moved down here to the canyons and seamounts. And we saw, you know, that repeated in the data and that kind of data um, passed along to Audubon policy folks, got those, that Seamounts National Monument passed. It's not the only reason, but it's one of the reasons. We showed the importance of it to these birds that are already imperiled, all seabirds. It's the most imperiled group of birds on the planet. And puffins, just like all of them, are showing signs of decline. So that data combined with fisheries data and, and you know, multidisciplinary data was used at, in part with, and then with public support because everybody loves these birds, it, it, we passed this Seamounts um, National Monument. So that area is protected now. So with the, where the puffins need to go in the winter, so all sorts of fish, whales, lots of different kinds of seabirds, it's protected. So, so that, that those banding projects and that tracking data got a national monument in the ocean protected for these birds, hopefully forever. So really big impact from that kind of data just by putting these bands on the birds and also by bringing people out, talking about the, the puffin data and people would come to Maine, they come out on tours, they see these islands, they see these birds standing on the rocks just like this and then that they just love puffins. And then, and then they're really pushing their legislators and they're writing letters and they're doing things to get these seamounts protected and all of that really came in part from banding them, which is, which is a huge, huge impact, about as big an impact as you could have. So here's a bird. This is just, this is just a cool bird. I mean, <clears throat> an epic migration, one of the, one of the most epic bird migrations that there is. This is a bar-tailed godwit. So this is a bird that nests in Alaska and winters in New Zealand. This, of course, happens to be a bar-tailed godwit that was in the lagoon in Marco Island, Florida. Not sure why it was there, but it showed up and it was a pretty big deal when it came. I do have a volunteer, I guess I should mention Gene Hall, who takes all, all, any photo in my presentations that's worth anything or good, Gene takes. She's a really, she's an awesome photographer. She's at Project Puffin. She goes up there from Naples to take pictures in the summer. She goes all over and she took this picture for me uh, in the Tiger Tail Lagoon. I always talked about these birds, but I didn't have a good photo. Now I do, so that's pretty exciting. And it just looks like most other godwits, but this bird, makes a huge migration, the longest nonstop migration of any organism on the planet. So this is kind of what it looks like on the mudflats in Alaska, with the end of the summer, really late summer, maybe the end of August, they're down on these mudflats and these birds are just feeding nonstop, feeding and feeding and feeding and feeding. And while they're feeding, their chest muscles will expand 50%, their heart enlarges 30%. And when, they're, when they get to the point where, you know, you can't eat anymore and you can't get any fatter and those winds start to blow out of the Northeast, these birds will lift off something like this and they'll just take off into the ocean heading Southwest. And, oh, I should mention before they take off, their entire digestive tract atrophies because they won't be needing it anymore. So it's just a waste of energy to have it. So it kind of shrivels up, if you can imagine, like just shrivels to nothing because they won't be eating anything and they just head off into the ocean. And they put transmitters on these birds. And this is what it looks like. You can see, <laughs> you can see how this bird, this bot flies over open ocean all the way to New Zealand from those mudflats in Alaska. 
and it leaves August 30th, this bird left, E7, and it arrived September 7th, eight days later, almost 12,000 kilometers, nonstop flight. And these birds don't glide like a lot of seabirds. This bird is flapping its wings constantly for eight straight days, and then somehow finds its way to, finds its way to New Zealand. So for, well, it's an amazing story for one thing. The wings are flapping millions of times, and this bird just flies, knows where to go, never stops flying, which is a really, really amazing thing. It's probably the most amazing bird migration that there is, really, when you, when you think about it. And then in the spring, you can see what it does. It flies, it flies up to the Yellow Sea, which is another really long, not quite as long, but over 10,000 kilometers, which is really far. And it feeds there and then heads back. So it's stopping again, kind of like the Black Pole Warbler. It needs energy when it gets to Alaska because it's going to be breeding. So it's a little bit different strategy when you're heading up in the spring and you're going to eat in the Yellow Sea and then you're back to the mudflats in Alaska. So as far as management is concerned, it's obvious that the mudflats in Alaska are super important because this migration, this bird wouldn't even make it halfway without it. It needs, it needs healthy ocean and it needs those undisturbed mudflats to feed. And then when it gets to New Zealand, it needs to have food. It's going to go where it knows to go and there needs to be um, habitat there to support it. So it's super important there. And then the Yellow Sea, which I think probably out of all of these sites that this bird needs is the most imperiled and one of the most important. And it's, it's important for all sorts of birds too, you know, spoonbill sandpipers, which you see a lot about in the news, all of these things, lots of shorebirds and seabirds are using those mudflats there to forage and fatten up for their breeding seasons or their migration. So it's really, really important that it, that it makes it. And another thing that these birds are doing, I, I mean, there might be a question at the end about this, that this bird doesn't sleep when it's flying. Well, what these birds can do, it's a unilateral or unihemispheric shortwave sleep, it's called. So I think the best way to think about that is it, it's like sleeping with one eye open. It turns off half its brain is asleep. The other half of its brain is aware. So constantly moving, moving that back and forth, both hemispheres of the brain, where it can, it can rest if you want to call it rest. Its brain can rest while it's flying because it's constantly flying and burning energy. So that's how, that's kind of how they do that. It's, it's just uh, sleeping with one eye open is the best, like turn, turning off half your brain and leaving the other half on so you're aware of what's around you and then switching that periodically back and forth across those eight days. This, of course, this is one of my favorite birds, but I'm a tern guy, I guess. That terns are my favorite species of birds, a bird I've worked with a lot. This is an Arctic tern. So this really is the champion migrant. This bird would not be impressed with what the bar-tail godwit does or the red knot or anything like that. It's, I mean, child's play to this bird. This bird's little too, 100 grams. I mean, it weighs, it's like a, I mean, it'd be like an empty soda can in your hand or maybe a little bit left in it. It's all it feels like, hardly anything there. But terns are super powerful flyers, graceful flyers. They call them sea swallows. And this just happens to be the one that go, they all travel long distances. But this one travels a long, long way. So here's just a shot of it flying. You can see this bird is built to fly. It's got those long, pointed, slender wings. It grabs the air really well. And here's the little device. This is a geolocator, like the ones that were on the puffins. They are also put on Arctic terns just to see like what they're doing, where they're going, where they're stopping, because there's a serious decline in Arctic tern populations in the North Atlantic. I think 70% decline in the last 11 or 12 years. And so trying to get a better idea of what's happening to these birds and why, why they're having so much trouble. So here's a little track. This is three Arctic terns. This is their, this is their fall migration where they're moving to spend the winter our winter, and it's still, of course, it's, it'll be summer in Antarctica. They're heading down there where they, where they spend um, the Antarctic summer. And you can see this is track. And you can see these areas here where the lines get close together and looks like someone just scribbled in a circle. This is an area where these birds spend some time. So they didn't just fly through, they were hanging around there flying in circles. So it shows that there's something important there for those birds where they wanna stay. So we think that it's feeding areas. So these are important hotspots for feeding where this bird's fueling up. Then you can see it flying down and then off the coast, off the east coast of um, South America, really important place it looks like for these birds to fuel. And here's tracks, of, uh, there's different tracks. These birds didn't go quite as far west. 
They weren't really, they didn't really go to Africa, but they did hit those same two spots. So those are definitely hot spots for these birds, important feeding sites for these birds. So that helps us as managers um, know like where these birds need to find food during these migrations. And then here is a winter. This is the winter um, track of 11 birds back and forth along the Antarctic shelf, a lot of density in the Weddell Sea where they seem to be spending a lot of time feeding. So again, that's a spot that needs to be protected. And of course, we all know that area of the world needs to be protected for all sorts of reasons and all sorts of species depend on it, including humans. And here's the return track. See, this is a more, much more direct. They're not really stopping in a lot of places to feed. They're just making a beeline when it's time straight back to the Gulf of Maine. It's breeding season. They know they have limited time. You know, that season is short in Maine. It's not, you only have a couple of months to get it done and then you need to head back south. So they don't waste any time getting back. And here's what it looks like when you put it all together. So each one of these birds, the average was close to 90,000 kilometers which is pretty much 60,000 miles a year. Every single year, that's what they do. And some of these birds that I've trapped in Maine are 29 and 30 years old. So those birds were raising chicks. They were, this one bird in particular I can remember was 29 years old and had flown 60,000 miles a year for 29 years, which is just an amazing thing to think about. And you can really see from this bird, that little tiny island in Maine. And sometimes when we're working with these birds in Maine, you're on this little rock that's maybe 10 acres and there's Arctic terns on it. And it's such a small little fishbowl that you're working in. And when you see this, it makes you realize that that's just a tiny, tiny piece of this bird's world. And it's literally using a quarter of the globe um, to make its living. So this, this bird is so dependent on environmental stewardship and the ocean and not just locally, but, but globally. I mean, there's, you can see all the different all these different patches that are really dense on this map up here and then down off of South America. And then of course, again, the Weddell Sea. And I'll say that observing these birds during the breeding season, one of the big problems, and this is pretty sad that they're having is in the Gulf of Maine. So you would think, oh, something's going on off of South America and they're overfishing and their environmental regulations aren't good. And that's why the Arctic turn is declining. It may be part of the reason, but, a, but one of the biggest reasons is they can't raise chicks anymore. They fly from the islands in Maine looking for food and they come back with nothing a lot of years or they're catching moths on the island to feed them. So the Gulf of Maine is warming 99% or it's warming faster than 99% of the rest of the world's oceans. So it's like a little fishbowl and a little look into the future of what will happen in other places when the things that are happening in Maine start happening in these other locations. So we really need to be um, we really need to be um, paying attention to fisheries biology, um, the climate. We all know that it's like I'm preaching to the choir here, but it's a really big deal, and it's a really big deal for the Arctic tern. So a lot of those pelagic juvenile bait fish are not where they're supposed to be when the Arctic tern needs them to be there. So they're not getting enough food to feed their chicks. And I will say, most of those birds on the Project Puffin Islands now have a period in the summer where they can't find food. Even the puffins can, can, you know, they can catch 10, 15, 20 bait fish at a time to bring back to the burrow to feed the one chick that they're raising. And many chicks during the summer starve now. These birds can dive down 200 feet for food. So it's not just the turn that's only diving a foot and all the fish are just a little bit below. Sometimes in the summer, there's no, no fish for anybody. So it's really something that we need to pay attention to. And as researchers we are paying attention to, fisheries biologists as well. So this bird kind of shows us, well, how amazing that they are. And for some reason, some of them are 30 years old. So they are able to survive. They just need, they need us to give them just a little bit of space and a little bit of what they need and they can do the rest by doing, doing an epic migration like this every single, every single year. The last bird, and this is just a good story, the last bird I want to talk about is Wisdom the Albatross. A lot of you may have be familiar with this bird. This is the oldest known wild bird. Um, the reason that we know that is because it's banded. So this bird was banded in 1956, um, and it's a Laysan albatross. So it was banded on Midway in 1956 by Chandler Robbins, who worked for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and was banding birds out there. Back then, they just used metal bands. You, it was hard to recite them. 
not like this. You can see this big red band on, on Wisdom now. She's been, she was given this band, but Chandler banned this bird in 1956, 46 years later. He was 40 years old at the time. He was on Midway again, 46 years later. And in 2002, he recited a bird that he recognized an old band and he thought it was one that he did. And then it was. And once they checked the data, they found out that this bird was, was this old. So when they found that out, they rebanded the bird with this band. It's a red band with white letters. It's Z333. That's Wisdom's band number. And she comes back to the same nesting site that you see here every single year to breed. And she's still alive. She was at least five years old when she was banded in 1956. She, she was seen for the first time this year, a few days ago on November 29th. So they, they always watch Wisdom's um, nesting site, of course. And she came back November 29th. They confirmed very recently that she is on an egg. So again, she's raising another chick. I think she's raised, I don't even know how many chicks now, maybe 30, 35 in her lifetime. And she's 70 years old or older, and she's still going, <clears throat> which is just amazing when you think about these seabirds that so many of them, and you see these horrifying pictures of chicks, you know, desiccated, just their carcasses on the ground full of plastic and things like that but somehow this bird has dodged all of those pitfalls since at least 1956 i mean this bird well this bird was at least born in 1951 maybe maybe much earlier than that we don't know but at least since 1951 this bird's been flying all over that ocean and probably flown eight million or nine million nautical miles in, in her lifetime always coming back to the same nest location they mate for life but probably this bird is probably on mate number three because she just outlives everybody. But the current mate that she has has been her mate since 2010. And again, she's raising another chick. So I think this shows that there's hope for these birds. I mean, this bird somehow has survived all of the, the stuff that has been thrown at it, whether it's storms or, or humans, all the things that we do to degrade the environment. Somehow this bird is navigating that and surviving and doesn't seem to be feeding her chicks as much plastic as the other ones. Not all of her chicks survive, but she does raise a lot of chicks. So somehow this bird, this bird knows how to avoid things and knows, or is just lucky. But I would say after this long, it's more than luck. And there's probably other, other albatross out there that are just like wisdom. There's probably many more wisdoms that we don't know about. Lots of birds nest on these islands, as you can imagine, hundreds and hundreds of thousands. And I think in total now, we're getting, we're approaching 300,000 birds that have been banded. So there is a lot of data out there, but the majority of the birds aren't banded. So there's probably other birds that could be old, as old or older. So I think this bird is just kind of, we didn't get a lot of management data from, um, from wisdom, but just a lot of, I think, wisdom from wisdom, I think is what we've, we've received, which I think is pretty cool that this bird somehow is surviving. And I think this bird, more than any banded bird, is kind of like that, beacon of hope that everybody needs, especially it seems like every year we need more and more of it, 2020 for sure. But during this crazy year, wisdom is back. Wisdom is on the island, sitting on an egg and gonna raise another chick, what I think is just a really cool story. And one that should hopefully keep continuing year after year. And I can take any questions anybody has about banding or. Yeah, we, we do have a few questions here. All right. Yeah, that, that was that was excellent. I guess in hindsight, it makes perfect sense that a discussion about banding should turn into a discussion about migrations. I mean, it, it makes perfect sense. And, right. And as you said, it tells a good story. That was great. All right. So um, let's see. Gail Dewsbury asked the question: uh, Given the times we're in now with COVID, uh, when you're banding these birds, uh, are you concerned about the the virus getting to the birds? And I guess vice versa. We know there's some cross species uh, transfer going on. Yeah, so this summer, the banding project kind of changed as, as one could imagine. Um, I went out there with just one other person when we were going. Um, so we had to follow protocols. So we didn't ban as many birds this year, I should say. Because of that, we were limited as to what we could do. And I don't know that I haven't seen any um, cross-contamination in seabirds that I've seen, but that doesn't mean it doesn't happen. And of course, where a lot of these birds nest in most seabirds, unless you're harassing them like I was, 
they're not coming into contact with people or, you know, or they're living in places like some of these seabirds are living on islands, islands that I've been to that are, you know, a five day boat ride from people. So they're really low exposure to humans. What I will say um, as an update to the black skimmer um, banding project this summer on Marco Island, we noticed in mid June, we had some birds that their ankle joint, you know, it looks like the knee and their digits were swelling. We had about 275 chicks on the island and kind of like once they were a little over 10 days old, maybe we started seeing some of this and it started happening more and more. And then it started looking like something unusual to me. At the end, if you fast forward through this whole progression of, of this, this illness that the birds had, at least two thirds of those chicks died. So that skimmer colony on Marco Island this summer basically failed. And these birds had septic arthritis in the joints of their legs. We sent birds off for necropsy, things like that. And it, we found staph, pseudomonas, enterococcus, and E. coli in the joints of those birds. So my guess is they had some kind of contact dermatitis or it was in the food coming from an unknown source. It, we, you know, we, we couldn't do the genetic testing to know if it was human-born bacteria or not. I, my guess would be that it would be human-born bacteria. I would say sewage. Those bacteria are all common in human sewage. So that kind of illness um, did happen. We didn't have, you know, we weren't really concerned about COVID, but down here in Southwest Florida, more and more over the last few years, we've been seeing these other things happening, which all seem to be related to water quality. Um, so that's unfortunate, but we don't have the resources or the plan in place to really nail down what's happening when it's happening because there's some lags and testing and funding and things like that. So, so that's kind of what we saw this summer. And what I would say is a lot of times when I'm handling birds, I'm more concerned about um, what they could pass to me. So this summer, after knowing what those birds had, lots of those things could be transferred from a bird to a human. So I would say if you are ever involved in a banding project, like I always tell everybody, like biosafety is a big, and I think it's big both ways. So you want your hands to be clean when you're handling a bird. So you're not passing anything to it. You don't want sunscreen or, or insect repellent on your hands because it can damage the waterproofing on a bird. So you want to really be careful about your hygiene when you're handling a bird. And then also when you're done, you really want to make sure you have hand sanitizer and you clean your hands thoroughly after handling birds because you could get an illness from the bird. So I think that kind of thing works both ways. And I guess those of us that ban birds, it's just kind of something that we do. We make sure we're not giving anything to the bird to the best of our ability and getting anything from the bird. That makes sense. So we have a, uh, a Audubon, uh, Alacho Audubon has a, a bird banding program starting up. I'm sure you've heard about that. And uh, so that's, I'm sure they're doing that. I haven't been out there, but I'm sure they're doing their, their diligence with hygiene. Oh, I'm sure. We, on in that note, um, Emily asked that uh, once this whole uh, the COVID thing has has died out, hopefully, uh, if we if you'd be interested, um, see, would you be willing to let interested people from Alachua County volunteer to help ban your skimmers if they sure. were to travel down to Marco Island? Yeah, sure. Um, that, and that's just going to I guess depend on you know whatever happens with our current situation. Um, you know, Audubon, of course, and in myself included, we're very uh, I'm very strict with our protocols during this this pandemic so if everything gets you know i would say once people are vaccinated that's probably my best guess whenever that is then we'll be able to bring people out and my contact information here on this slide um you know the first one that's my email address and i can be contacted um about that um if somebody just if you'd shoot me an email if anybody that's interested sends me an email about it then they'll be on my I'll put them on my list so that when we're back to normal we can get out there and typically just so people know what I tend to do makes it difficult if you're traveling um I tend to leave the boat dock like two o'clock in the morning get to Marco Island about 2 30 to the colony I we take a boat in the dark and then we 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 catch and ban those birds for two hours, you know, right before sunrise. So that's kind of the timing of it. I know it's not convenient for a lot, you know, but it is, it is really fun. It is really fun to do. It's, it's definitely worth, and it's really nice. There's no one on the beach, just the birds. Yeah. And then the sunrise. So it is, yeah. it is pretty fun. Ends in a high note. Uh, I have a question uh, this, we very frequently see birds, including our, the whooping crane here that we get that, uh, 
at uh, Payne's Prairie it has multiple bands on it, like your picture here. Is that just multiple episodes of banding, or is there do they put multiple bands in one shot? They do. So this bird is um, is interesting because it it has that that upper band on the upper right leg, which is an alphanumeric field readable band, which that's the only Wilson's plover banded with that combination in color. So that's enough. That's enough to identify that bird as an individual. But a lot of plovers that you might see would have a solid green, let's say a solid green or orange flag there with no, no digits on it at all. And then you can see on the other leg, there's a metal band, which is the upper leg. It's hard to see, but it's there. And that's kind of the bird's social security number. We have to give that the government, my banding permit makes me give those to skimmers as well. And then you'd have these color bands. So the combination of the color bands along with that solid plastic band is that bird's unique identifier. So, you know, I have a bird now, a Marco, that has an orange, an orange flag on the upper right. And then on the lower right has black, black, two black bands. And on the lower left, it has a light blue band. So that bird, when you read that bird's band, it's orange flag, black, black, light blue. So that's that bird's name for lack of a better term. Right. That's kind of how, and sometimes the colors are, are different. There's a Pan American shore, uh, shorebird banding protocol, which the knots fall into. So if you see a knot with a green flag, it's a North American bird. You know that it's, it's, it was banded here. And if you see an orange flag like that bird, B95, that's, that's the color for Argentina. Red is Chile, blue is Brazil. So, so even without reading the band, we know the country of origin when we see it. And that's because those birds are multi-hemisphere travelers. So there has to be, which is good they thought of this, has to be a plan so everybody's not, you know, using the same color and combinations. All right. Yeah, you're talking about B95 kind of tricked me into thinking out it was much simpler than it is, obviously. <laughs> um, and Laura Gadet asked that, do North American and South American skimmer populations mix? So not that we've seen, right? So, you know, when you read the books, I think it says like as far south as our skimmers would go as Panama. Um, we haven't seen birds banded. And I have a, a friend that, that did a, a bunch of work with river nesting skimmers um, down there. And so they're not nesting on the ocean, they're nesting in rivers and on um, bar, sandbars in the river, things like that. And they banded a lot of those birds. And we haven't seen those birds here. And to my knowledge, they haven't seen our birds there. But I would say in the last couple of years, the skimmer banding has really ramped up, especially on the East Coast. So they're now banding them in Massachusetts, New York, New Jersey, North Carolina. We have a couple of places in Florida, Texas, Mississippi, they're banding them on the West Coast around San Diego. So there's more and more of them getting added to the population of banded birds. And we'll probably start to see some pretty interesting movement once we have enough banded members in the population. All right, and she asked the second part, uh, do, the, the, do the Massachusetts or New Jersey banded birds ever stay to nest in Florida or Florida birds move to more northern nesting colonies. So are they consistent in their travel patterns? Or do they break it up? Yeah, not that we haven't seen that yet. Um, that could be another thing that when more and more birds um, are banded, we might see. So typically, when you when you think about these birds like terns and skimmers, gulls, these any any of these larids, they they typically return to their natal colony to breed. So you would expect to see tern chicks banded on you know, Eastern Egg Rock in Maine to come back there to breed. That's, that's kind of what we see, that's the pattern. What's interesting about Florida is that the, the skimmers are not moving far, but they're moving, I, some of my birds nested in Pinellas County this summer. So I banded them on Marco in 2017, they decided to nest in Pinellas County. And then the, the opposite is true, Pinellas County birds are nesting down in Marco Island. So it's kind of like, instead of just that one colony being their, their spot, it's this whole, a meta population, this, this big geographic area that's that bird's home range, which is very interesting. Not what we, not what I would have thought I would see, but it does lend itself well to genetic mixing and things like that. So you're kind of bringing new blood into the different colonies. Marco blood's going to Pinellas and Pinellas blood's coming to Marco. And then Lee County is getting Pinellas and Marco birds. So it's, it's interesting to see that it's like almost one big colony with sub colonies within it. So that's not something I would have expected, but now we're starting to see that now. It makes sense to be up, right? As you said, a lot more genetically healthy. Right. 
uh, Ellen Toms asks, are there any important sea and shorebird nesting areas in Florida that require protection, such as the sand island next to Fort DeSoto Park? Yep, so that like their Outback Key is really important. So I would say with, and not just in Florida, but anywhere where these birds, these beach nesting birds nest, wherever that is, is important because there's so such limited space. So down here, um, we have an island called Second Chance. It's a critical wildlife area. It's right at the northern edge of the 10,000 islands. So I would say starting there, and then Marco Island is one of the bigger colonies in Florida. Lee County, another really big colony, and then several sites in the Pinellas County area. In the Panhandle of Florida is a big stronghold for snowy plovers. Northeast Florida as well. So all of those sites are actively monitored by volunteers, professional biologists, seasonal interns and biologists. Um, so all of those sites are protected and some of them are critical wildlife areas as well, which adds another layer of protection for them. So all of those sites are critical. So you know like how many miles and miles and miles of shoreline in Florida and just those sites that I can name, maybe it's a dozen. That's all the birds really have. So out of all the miles of coastline, there's just, you know, maybe a dozen Large, larger populations of these nesting birds and strongholds for them in Florida. So, and they're very heavily protected, I would say. So my program, we do a lot of the research and we're monitoring. We also have, I hire a seasonal anchor steward, which their job is to manage a group of volunteers that go out on the beach. So they set up kind of like a 10 by 10 tent so they don't fry in the sun. And then they stay out there all day, Saturday, every Saturday and Sunday, the whole breeding season long, and they're there to educate the public and the beachgoers about the birds. So it's a constant effort with FWC, um, DEP, Audubon Florida, you know, a lot of organizations and a lot of volunteers that help with whether it be tabling events or actual outreach on the beach. That's kind of how we keep these birds going here is with a constant management. 